This is Prophet and Prophecies. This is the tenth teaching, and this is CD 5B, the last teaching of this series from the Prophet Tom Deckard. Before we get started, we'll open up in prayer. Father God, Yahweh, come before you, Father. We worship you and we praise you, Father, our Lord, our God. And Father God, we come and we, we ask that you forgive us. We come in repentance and we thank you for the forgiving of our sins, Father, against you and your holy covenant. Father God, I ask it for me, my family, for what I put my hand to, Father, for Ephraim in Yeshua's name. We just speak to any curses that are on us. Curses, you're gone in Yeshua's name. You are not bound to us. Darkness. Familiar spirits. Anything that would assert itself against us. You were bound in Yeshua's name. What bound in heaven is bound on the earth and below the earth, bless God. We loose the power of the Rock Kadesh that brings all truth to open up as we go through this ministry, as we are hearing it and seeing it, Father God. We just bind up our mind and our flesh that would come against it, Father. We loose the angels on their assignments, Father, that they have. And we just send the angels out, Father God, to minister, to minister to me, Father, to minister to the audience, Father God. In Yeshua's name, Yeshua's name, Yeshua's name. Ah, bless God. Hallelujah. Well, we're, we're still in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, 32. And behold, I am against them that prophesy falsely. Dreamers, false dreamers. Saith the Lord. And to tell them to cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yea, I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit his people at all, saith the Lord. I'm going to give you an example of this, and we're going to, we're going to turn it around a little bit here. A little different example than we've gone through in the, in the last ten teachings. Or last nine, I should say, this being the tenth. We're talking about people who pushed Y2K, and uh, I guess if you're, if you're well under 20-some years old, you wouldn't remember that. But Y2K, 1999, they were afraid that all these things were going to happen in the world uh, because they, the computers and things didn't know how to turn to 2000. They never thought of it or something, who knows, but, the, you know, what, what, what brought that about? What brought about the fear and all the things that came about that? came from a soothsayer. It came from a familiar spirit. And it came and it was spoken and it infected the people. And what did it do? It caused fear. And there's people who pushed it and there's people who profited an enormous amounts of money on that. And they got blood on their hands in that day. They will have blood on their hands. You're saying, wait a minute, you're talking about Y2K and this and that and there's a depth to this. There is a depth to this. I mean, the people who listened to this, who went out and they got food and, and items for the Y2K, it didn't profit them. I'll tell you something. The things that they did in preparation for that, the falseness coming from a soothsayer, falsely prophesying, guess what? What they put their hand to was cursed in preparation with that, in connection with that. People fell into a trap. And people just gobbled it up, didn't they? But now that we know, now that we know, now we know how far and how deep this whole thing's going with soothsayers and what you believe and what you prepare for under whose direction. So interesting, so interesting, this teaching. From the prophet. I mean, the prophet said for a year that it was a familiar spirit before the, 
the 2000 clock turned before this Y2K. He said it was false. He says, don't go near it. You'll be cursed. And people wonder why they can't get things right when we take that example. And then we take that example and then we lay other things that we did in our life that we prepared for or that we put our hand to or spoke into, towards. We created. Think about all the things that you have or have done or possess that are cursed. Think about it. Think about it. From that example, from the prophet. They don't even know they're cursed. They don't even know they're cursed where they're living. And they're going to be cursed for the rest of their days. And they're wondering, why can't I get a little bit ahead or have this or that? The depth of this teaching. Please understand the depth. Take the time. Hit pause if you need to. Sit there. Meditate just on that. The depth. So we could be free. Free. But what's happening in our time segment? What are we hearing through the news, through people, through government, that we are putting our hand to? Hmm. Interesting. I mean, familiar spirits are using them, manipulating them for their goals. And we're getting sucked in. And when we're tuned into those things, for their goals, for a familiar spirit, for darkness's goals, it's cursed. It's cursed. We have to be over here. I guess this is the good side today. Well, we have to be over here. Over here, where the Father is. You know, he says, come out. Come out from that whore. But people, they can't, they, 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 they love darkness. They love to hear it. Right? They love to be fooled, even knowingly. The judgment is here. Right? The separation by choice is a process. By choice. It's not bang. You know it all. You keep going, and you push, and you go, and you become more holy, and you become more holy, and you become more holy unto the Father God by coming out of the whore, the church, the system. The things that they're convincing you with and fear and other things to put your hand to. It is the word of God that we rely on, not the words of those that would not follow the truth, no matter how much they try to pretty up that truth, to fool us, to convince us. Ears to hear, eyes to see, spiritually from the Father. We'll go on in Jeremiah 23, 33. And when his people, or the prophet, or the priest, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will ever forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet, and the priest, and the people, that shall say, The burden of the Lord, I will ever punish that man in his house. Ever punish saying God is a burden. And then 35, Thus shall ye say every one unto his neighbor and every one to his brother, Who hath the Lord answered? And what has the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall he mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. Wow. <laughs> You're not going to say God's the burden. But you know what? What you comes out of your mouth that's going to be your burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord, of the hosts of God. So every man's word shall be his burden. I mean, you could hit pause again, and you could sit and you could meditate on yourself, not others, of what it is that you have said, allowed in, and spoke and created to put in your life. What burdens have you placed on yourself, on your family? See, you, it's you, me, it's me, them, it's them. You fix you, I fix me. It's your burden, it's 
my burden. So what's he saying here? At the end of the day, he's saying, just stop it. Just stop it. Just shut up. Shut to your mouth. <laughs> I mean, if you cannot do it right, prophet's saying here, just get out of the way. He's saying, let a real prophet in. Let one that's going to be used by God come in. Just get out of the way. Everyone's replaceable by God. You know, you got to take these things that are said and you have to apply them to your life. But people don't want to hear this type of preaching. People do not like this type of preaching. Why? Because it's the flesh man. It's the pride that they got to take out. But if you can see it in the spirit and you have something jump up inside you, a little bit of pride there, you know what? Grab it. Peel it back. It's set there. It's an indicator now. You know. Don't grab hold of it when it pops up and run with it. When it pops up inside of you, go, wait a minute. Get the pen and paper, write it down, search it. Stop what you're doing. Go to the Father and he'll show you. Get rid of the burden. Just get rid of the burden. Let the Father just pour his blessings on you and your family. Your job is to get rid of the burden. Get rid of the curse. Enjoy the indicators. Enjoy them. 2337. Thus shall thou say unto the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee? And what has the Lord spoken? But since ye say, The burden of the Lord thereof, thus said the Lord, because ye say his word, the burden of the Lord, and I have set you unto you saying, you shall not say the burden of the Lord. God saying, no, no, you're not supposed to do that, okay? The word is not a burden, absolutely not a burden. But you have said it's a burden, so you are speaking against the Lord God and his word, speaking against him. And in 39, therefore, behold, I, ever, I will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you. And the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. Wow. And I will bring you everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. I mean, that is intense. I mean, but we do have to understand when he's saying this, it's because he had already warned them. This is now judgment. And what we're reading here, perpetual shame, which shall not be forgotten. I mean, I don't want to go that way. I do not want to go that way. And I know you don't either. But let's go on to Jeremiah 28.1. 28.1. And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, and in the fourth year, and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, which was a gibbon, spoke unto the house of the Lord and in the presence of the priest and all of the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Okay, it's a prophecy. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring again into this place, all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried off to Babylon and in, and in four. And I will bring again to the place of Jacona, the son of Jacona, king of Judah, with all the captivities of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon." Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hanukkah, all right, now the seasoned prophet, eh? In the presence of the priests, in the presence of all the people, he stood in the house of the Lord. So he didn't do it in a closet. This is happening, not in the back room. This is happening in the presence of the Lord, of the priests, of the people. And in 28.6, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform the words which thou hast prophesied. Okay. He's like, hey, it's a good thing. 
and bring the vessels of the Lord's house and carry away captive from the Babylon into this place. Nevertheless, hear thou now the word which I speak in thine ears and in the ears of the people. Okay, now he's speaking. The prophet that has been before me and before thee of old prophesied against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesied of peace when the word of the Lord shall come to pass, which shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the neck of all the nations, which the space of two full years, and the prophet Jeremiah went his way. See, prophet Jeremiah, he's saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, he, he didn't agree with all these additions and where, you know, this uh, young Hanukkah, son of Azur, the prophet spoke. No, he was being, he's, so what did he do? And then, when he went away, the Lord, the word of the Lord, came on to Jeremiah the prophet, after Hanukkah the prophet had broken the yoke off of the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and saying, and go tell Hanukkah, all right, here it is from God, say, thus saith the Lord has broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make them yokes of iron. Okay, now wait a minute. It sounds like Hanukkah was absolutely wrong. Wrong. He took it too far. He went where God was not going. He spoke in God's house, in front of the priests, and in front of the people. Wow. You know what's going to happen, right? You know the curses? The things that are going to come for once he did? Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. In 28.14, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. All right. I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all the nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I gave him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hanukkah, The prophet, hear now, Hanukkah, the Lord has not sent thee, all right, he's getting called out. But thou maketh his people trust a lie. So it's the same thing we've been studying about, isn't it? The same thing. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I cast thee off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord God. I mean, here he's casting him off the face of the earth. I mean, we read, we read in the last uh, scriptures that earlier on, that false prophets die, right? Within a year, judgment. And we read that earlier in the last series. And here it is, from God, the judgment coming through a seasoned prophet. Wow. And in 17, so Hanukkah, the prophet died the same year and in the seventh month. Wow. So it didn't work out for him, did it? No, not at all. But it, he started speaking, and it wasn't from God, and he did it. Where? He, basically from behind the holy bima, from the place where the Father is. Wow. The Word says that a lot of these people that are going around and they're shooting their mouths off, they're going to die. They're going to die. I mean, maybe it needs to be that way. Maybe it needs to be that way as the Father goes forward in this transition. Maybe we need to get a few people out of the way, right? I mean, are they cursing more people and, and doing more harm than what God has, needs to get done? Yeah, there's those people out there. Others people are wearing these curses of these false prophets and where these false prophets live. I mean, it's such a shame for the body of Messiah. Of Messiah. Here's another one. Here's another good story from Jeremiah. And it came to the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, 
Send to all them of the captivity, saying, Thus saith the Lord concerning Shemaiah and Nemorite, the Nemorite, because Shemaiah has promised unto you, and I sent him nigh, and he caused you to trust a lie. Uh oh. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nemorite and his seed. All right, now we're getting down to something. Now it's getting real bad. It's not just the gentleman, the prophet, that went out there and tried to do something that he thought was good, but he stepped out from under his anointing, he got into the flesh, familiar spirit, whatever it was, and he started prophesying something that wasn't from God. And guess what? Now it is him and his seed that have to pay the price. Wow. Ye shall not not have a man to dwell among his people, neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, saith the Lord, because he is taught rebellion against the Lord. Taught rebellion against the Lord. You know, I mean prophets. I mean prophets. What an awesome responsibility. The mouthpieces of God on this earth. I mean, they have to do it right. And if they don't, the people go wacko. They go wacko. Prophets are set here by God, given the tools. They have to develop them, but to be able to connect with him, to prophesy his words only. See, God needs people in this earth to speak what it is that he needs spoken in this realm. Men have to choose him, his kingdom, and speak it. And his words only. I mean, but then when the mistakes happen, when the enemy infiltrates, it goes wacko. It causes harm. Teaching rebellion against God, lying. Something got in there somewhere that wasn't from God. I mean, you could take this now and we could take this into a personal context. What have we said? What have we done? Thinking that we are, what? Connecting it to God. We're placing things that aren't of God, and we're speaking, we're putting our hand to it, and we're giving it to the body of Messiah. It is so, so, so important. This teaching is within prophets and prophecies. What you could do, and you can apply here the other fivefold. You could apply the gifts. You could apply in judgment, murmuring, whatever. You are taking things that are not of God and you're saying it is of God. False is what we don't want to be. We want to be in the fullness what it is to be within the community, to be sheep, and we're all sheep. We want to be in the fullness within the gifts that he's given us, that we just do those gifts. Not trying to be more than what we are. To be the fullness, if you're in the five-fold ministry, to be what it is that is. And just that. And no more. Just whatever the tools the Father gave you, you want to be able to develop and implement and penetrate the rest of the community because the anointing is for the community. Yeah, what a teaching. What a teaching. The goal is to be holy. The goal is not to be false. But let's talk about when there's a false prophet. When we talked about this earlier, and there's a little bit of a summary here. So if a prophet is not telling the truth, what do we do? What do we do with them? Well, in Deuteronomy 13.3, it says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or dream or dreams, right? If they're false. No, you step away, you move away from that. We go on at 20, verse 6. And the soul turneth after such has a familiar spirit and after wizards to go whoring after them. And even I set my face against that soul and I will cut him off from among his people. We read that scripture before too. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to get away from them so that we're not cut off. But what are we supposed to cause harm? No. In Amos. 
Do my prophets no harm. Do my prophets no harm. So what, what happens? Prophets are required to address other prophets. That office addresses that office. I mean, in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let them judge. So they get together. They do it. And if any thing be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. And then 31, for ye may all prophesy one by one that ye may learn and may be confronted, confirmed, sorry. But it sounds like they're supposed to be able to work together. They're supposed to be able to connect and to talk. And if there's something going wrong, they are to go to one another. It is their responsibility within that office to go and to make absolutely sure that there is something that another prophet is accidentally betraying God's trust. Confirming. Because it is the most important thing in the world to them to be right with God. But it's also the most important thing with a man's flesh to say, God picked me. God picked me. It's me. It tries to get in there and take the credit. But a prophet wants to make sure, to make sure, to make sure, and he's got other prophets to make sure. And it goes on. Prophets judge other prophets. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And that's in uh, 1432. But if we keep going down, to what are we supposed to do when the body, it's not supposed to be polluted, it is. We're not supposed to regard those that have familiar spirits or seek after wizards that defile themselves. So says God. God uses other prophets to come in and do judgment over other prophets. We just read about it within Jeremiah and two examples. God is going to do the one that's going to handle them. And the prophets that have to come in and be able to correct or judge other prophets are going to do it under the direction of the Father. Deuteronomy 18.20 But the prophet which shall presume to speak in my, a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. In Deuteronomy 13.5 And the prophet or the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn away from the Lord your God, you away from the Lord your God. God cannot have his family, his sheep, be polluted. God is not putting up with it. The sheep, the body, are to turn from it, to come away from it, repent, break from the curse, and go where the real prophets are. God deals with the false prophets through prophets. Jeremiah pronounced judgment in the death of Hananiah. So where are we at today? Prophet Deckard was a seasoned prophet. He brought up seasoned prophets, right? Oh, or sorry, he was brought up under a seasoned prophet. And then when he was told, he was told he had to go out after a period of time. And it, he talks about the mistakes, the prophet, that he had to learn on his own after a period of time because he had to grow up, he had to learn, he had to mature and become seasoned. But the prophet... He brought up other prophets. He brought up the first fruits. And then we were sent out. We were sent out to go and mature. When the prophet was sent out, when he was brought up, he went out alone. He was absolutely alone. It was him and God. It was him and God. What do we have? We have us, Ephraim. We have the first fruits of the remnant. We have the prophets. And all of us have so much to learn. But here's the thing. We are in the restoration business. We are doing this together. We've read the book. There's a process of things that have to happen to be able to get into place. Eventually, we're going to be a lot closer. 
We're going to be tied together. We're going to be united. Absolutely. We're in the restoration business, but we have to come together. We have to learn by our mistakes. We are in the restoration business of Israel, the ten tribes. We have the keys from the prophet. But we have to come out from these curses. We have to come out from these preconceived ideas of ourselves. We have to come out from the preconceived ideas from each other and the preconceived ideas in there from familiar spirits because we have been duped from time to time because we're not living in the perfect holiness. We don't see the blessings upon us. So we know where we're at and what's in front of us that we need to do. But we have to get on the same page. It's part of our commission. But why does it have to get to the point where somebody's got to die for people to take notice, like in Jeremiah's day? Can we just choose to break the yoke, break what it is that we are bonding ourselves to within darkness, and come out from it and work together. See, the prophet had to watch all of us. And he talks about it in this series. And he says it was like a great drama for him. Now listen. It's the obedience that he had. He's watching it in the spiritual world. He knows what's going on in our lives. And then he would watch this drama, this, this, this almost a soap opera type of craziness, wacko that we brought. And But he would do what? God would say, okay, I'm going to say that and then say this. And there's so much more he could have said and he known to each and every single one of us what, what's going on. But he was so obedient. I mean, God would say to him, all right, I'm going to show you this. Don't, don't do it yet. Don't do that. Don't do this. But he knew so much. I mean, for him to be able to sit on so many things and so much for so long and sit on it and sit on something for years and years and years, I mean, and keep his mouth shut during that entire time while he's watching this great drama that we're all presenting to him. The drama, the familiar spirits, the preconceived ideas. Man, unbelievable. For 30 years, he sat on this message and then he taught it. God told him, you'll minister it when I tell you to do it. I mean, how amazing, how amazing for profit to be able to have that type of an attitude, love for the Father. But people, they're in such a mess now. We're in such a mess. We're in such a mess. We're out from under God's blessings. I mean, we're working diligently at his precepts, his new moon, his Shabbat, his feast, his covenant, and his other things. But it's time that we take a long, hard look whether we're being cursed or blessed. I mean, it's just time that we stop and we look at it. Admit it. I mean, people have heard the Lord's people say in a prayer to the Father, and they say a variation of this, but they, they say, search my heart, O Lord. Search my heart. So here's a question. How come the people don't hear God say, you're cursed? You got a curse here, you got this, you got that. How come they don't hear that? It's something to think about. I mean, people are cursed because they're, they're, they're using God's name in vain. Remember, if you hear something, if you follow after a person who uses his name in vain, you are cursed. There's a lot of curses. We talked before about... We broke the curses. And Prophet talks about they're broken. And as time, as we go forward with this, things will be brought to our attention. And you know what? Repent of it. Break the curse from your past that you keep bringing forward. Look at it like that. Look at the opportunity of it coming. And remember and repent. Think about it. Think about it, how it got there. Maybe there's some more. 
work with the Father as he takes you through this holiness process to become holy. Don't look at it like, oh yeah, I did it. And you keep speaking about it and you tie yourself back into it. Don't. you got to see it as an opportunity. This is so deep. Prophet said it is one of the deepest teachings that he has. But if you're doing it wrong and if you're following wrong, you're cursed. And if you're going through this, and if you don't have the right attitude towards looking at it and say, this is the process of me getting rid of familiar spirits and keeping them out and keeping away the curses. And this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to keep fighting it forward. This is great. Don't get weary in well-doing. Get rid of the preconceived. So there's a balance to this, a balance in your life. If your house is not straightened, right? If it's not organized, you got your whole house to manage, men, leaders of the homes. You got to watch what you're attaching God to in your statements, in your mind, where you're being deceived and where you're passing that off to in your family. And then they're deceived and they're caught into a fallacy. Your job is to go back and to fix that within your family, to spend the time where you know where the Father has taken you, where you need to go and talk to them. Not everything. You have personal things and all sorts of that. What I'm talking about is what it is that you're responsible for within your family, to teach them and to show them how a real man works with the Father God. Humble. Show them how you handle pride. You take it and say, oh, an indicator. Okay, something's going on. Oh, thank you, Father, that's what it is. And fix it. What a lesson for your family. We don't want to be a laughing stock. I mean, some of us push hard and some of us go off to the left or do little or do this or that or why, you know. Some of us think that, well, we've been prophesied about. We're in the book. Hallelujah. You know, it's amazing. The spiritual world knows, absolutely knows we're in the book. I mean, they know the word. And they're kicking us around. They're pulling our strings so that we can devour each other. Oh, it's so easy for them, isn't it? When are we going to realize they're attacking us because it takes us to bring in his kingdom with a goal, one of our goals, to become more united and more united, breaking down the strongholds within ourselves. You can't take your ball and go home like a child. I'm going to run down the road. I'm not talking to me. I don't like it that way. Can't do that. We've got a responsibility unto the Father. He put you here in this time, in this segment. He gave you the tools. It's time to come out. We did with the churches, didn't we? We came out of the world, didn't we? Okay. We're doing the precepts, the covenant, the testimony, the Holy Spirit, the Shabbat, the new moon. Yeah. It's time to tackle the curses, the familiar spirit, the angel of darkness that came as an angel of light and fooled you from your past. Don't carry it forward. We are free. But there's a process. Coming out from those familiar spirits. I mean, how many times do we have to be told over and over and over and over? Don't protect them. They are not your friend. They are your curse. Come out. Leave them. Speak to them. Rebuke them. Hmm. But people still, what do they do? They want to get along with them. They want to let them back in. Clean it up. Clean it up. You've got the tools. You've got the power of his name. You just got to put in the time. You got to put in the work. I mean, think about it. You want the blessings. God, through a prophet, has spoken 
that you're a prophet or, or, or you're in the fivefold or you have this gift or, or you're going to perform this for him. Hallelujah. Praise God. What a job. But let me tell you something. There's a job in front of that job. Oh, oh yeah. There's a job in front of that job with God. And that job is the process of being holy so that you can perform that job that you're excited about. Hallelujah. But if you're not holy, okay, well, I'm going to get holy. Then there's a process. We just got to get holy. That's the job in front of us. What is it? Address the familiar spirits. Rip down the pride. Speak to the curses. We got so much that we've accomplished with the Father already. We got this job in front of us, this, this thing. And then we have all of this opportunity and all of this walking in holiness to do with Him and do with each other and the family and Ephraim. Look at how much we've done and where we've come with the Father. Hallelujah. We got this small job that looks enormous, but it's so tiny. It's so tiny to what we've done and where we're going. You got this. Oh, you got this. I know you do. The Word says you do. Claim it. Take it. It happens through fasting and prayer. The key to entering into your development with the Spirit on this earth. Fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer. Keep the work up. And scriptural. See, I'm going to give you an example here of something that the prophet gives. And uh, let me fix this. See, some people say that they, they don't need the Holy Ghost. Okay, he's got some examples here. So, you, you know you can't do anything without the Holy Ghost. You can't be anointed without the Holy Ghost. And there's nothing in the Bible that is ever done by the anointing without the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost teaches you in all truth. <laughs> Amen. I mean, another example, curses stop the blessings coming into your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, at times the prophet would say, you know, why bother? Why bother? I mean, they're not listening. It, they're not doing anything. I mean, God, I don't care if they go to hell. I am done. I'm fed up. They're not listening. He would say that. He was a man. Frustrated. I could just imagine what he could see in the spirit, what he understood, and what the angels brought him in the relationship that he had. And from what... It's like, it's, it's like he was trying to explain to us a color that we couldn't see, but he could see. And there was no way for us, but by the Father, to be able to understand, but to be able to see. But frustrating. I mean, please take this message to heart. It is a big time teaching. I mean, I do not believe that this message has ever been taught since the time that Prophet first taught it, his material about 10 years ago. I mean, how many people are really going to get this message and run with it? Not many. Not many. To, to a large degree of, of the fullness of it. Man, but I pray that people are able to get whatever it is, wherever they're at within it, and they can circle back around and go through it again. Because there is so much freedom in life in what the prophet's talking about, understanding the process of coming out of faults. But to do it, you have to admit you're wrong. I have to admit I'm wrong. I mean, you've got to stand up there and you've got to admit that you have pride in an area and you're wrong. And then pride in this area where you're wrong and, and pride in this area where you're wrong. I mean, embrace it. Go for it. Because when you're done that job and you get and you're walking in holiness, what God has put in your life flourishes. It has no choice. 
but you have to be grounded in his word. You have to be taught correctly. Taught correctly. And don't get into thinking that, oh, I'm a great one with God. Ananias the prophet, what happened to him? He thought he was a great one. Look at him. Died. Dead. A prophet. Judged by the Father God. Spoken to by a seasoned prophet. Cursed him. And he died. Because the Father wanted it so. God sent Jeremiah. So that an other prophet would not pollute the camp. What an awesome responsibility it is to be a prophet. But God is not going to let anybody pollute the camp. His kids. He's invested in everybody. It's still a story. I mean, prophet was in Africa. And here's, here's, here's something interesting. And God says, look, you know, he told him to, to curse the ground where a tree was. The prophet said, he said, look, you curse that ground. And tell him in three days uh, the leaves in this tree will be gone. And then the brother that took the money will bring it back to you. So the prophet did what, the pro- what God had spoke to him. Cursed the ground, the tree. Leaves fell. Very shortly after, a brother came and says, Hey, I got some money for you. The prophet's like, are you sure? You know? He says, oh, absolutely. Saw that tree. Yep, it's your money. You take it. For a year, people walked around Africa, whatever, the, the, I don't know, the, 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 the country. It wasn't all of Africa, geez. But uh, to see what the, the tree's doing, that the prophet had cursed. They just wanted to touch it. They wanted to see it. See, real-time major prophets have the ability to curse. I mean, when will the fear come back to the office of the prophets? I mean, they feared the prophets. Elijah, eh? When those kids, they bald head, bald head, remember? It wasn't what they said. It was the disrespecting of the office is what happened. The modern world does not respect prophets. It'll come again. The third world, much more so. Remember the two she-bears came out and tore those kids apart? You know, bald head, bald head. I mean, something, there's a, and there's important information there in the scriptures with that. But the thing is, you do not mess with real prophets. You don't badmouth real prophets. You end up in the dirt real easily. Don't do it. Do my prophets no harm. See, this message is not against the real prophets. The real prophets. This is a message in supporting the real prophets. It's a message of separating the real prophets so that we know. We know about faults with prophets. We know about faults within our lives. And we know the curses that comes with faults. See, in the church today, the people, they they have to have prophecy, you know. I mean, the the, the fleshly uh, pursuit of competition. You know, they, they got the gifts of prophecy, right? And the gift of prophecy doesn't make you a prophet. It's a gift of prophecy. But what do they have in the church? They got to have somebody say, God said. In some churches, they got to have the tongues and interpretation of songs because they got to have God said. And it's amazing because in some of these churches, these people stand up, it's like clockwork. And then someone else interprets, it's like clockwork. That ain't God. I mean, what is that? That's at work. God doesn't do it like that. How do you know? Look in the book of Acts. Every time they got together, there wasn't the tongues and interpretation of tongues every time. Like clockwork. But people want to be a great one. Again, we're all sheep. We're all sheep. And his sheep hear his voice. You know, when someone goes off and starts to speak out from under the word, the sheep are to recognize it. There's a, they're to recognize it. The sheep are to say something. What? Oh, yeah. We've talked about this. Right? They're not supposed to go out, and God's not trying to have a whole bunch of spies and all this deception and, you know, get out of here. This is about being a true sheep, not a goat, not a wolf. Spies. 
Get out of here. You're sheep. If something's out from under the word, okay. Hey, show me that in the word. Hey, can you explain this to me over here? Okay. And if it's a prophet and you don't think it lines up, walk away. Walk away. You don't start bad-mouthing anyone. You start running your mouth off. The brother prophets are there to work with the other prophets. And God is going to do what God's going to do when God's ready to do it. And the real prophets are going to stand up and take care of what God needs to get done. God will not have damage and pollution in his camp with people running around false with his name. Story. A young prophet came to prophet and uh, he says, and he was a prophet. He says, look, uh, you know, I'd like to spend a week with you. Prophet said, okay, you can come in and, well, you know, we'll, we'll see where you're at. But if, uh, you know, you get going and, you know, you're off and you're missing it, I'm going to get up and rebuke you right where you stand. The young prophet said, you, you do that? He said, yeah. He says, is this a seasoned prophet? He was a young prophet. The prophet said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do that, all right. So the prophet said, you're going to start, you know, you can do an hour, and, you know, you know so, so the kid got up there, the young prophet, and got going, and the prophet said, hey, he, he spoke for an hour, he could have got what he needed to say done in 10 minutes, but hey, eh, whatever, he's growing up. So then there was a healing line came up, and then the young prophet started giving words. And the prophet's like, meh. All right, well, what's going on? And the next thing you know, the next person he goes to, and the young prophet says, the Lord God has told me you have a spirit of suicide. And the prophet just yells out, wrong! Nope, 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 try again. Try again. The young prophet said, I, I think that was God. The prophet said, don't you blame that on God. Now try again. He's like, what? Uh, yeah, I mean, he didn't know what to do. He didn't understand what he was being fed by. So the prophet said, okay, look. He went to the sister and he says, has you ever had a spirit of suicide? And she goes, never a day in my life. So the prophet looked at the young prophet. Okay. And look at this. He said, break the curse now, boy. Break it. He goes, what? What do you, what do you, break it? He says, you break that curse right now or I will drag you out of this church, kick you down the steps and drag you down the street. He said, you break it. Well, that young prophet repented immediately. He broke that curse that he spoke, he put forward, and then he went out that door. Prophet closed service. He went down to the hotel room where the young man was and knocked on the door and he said, uh, the young man opened the door and he said, uh, prophet, I'm not coming back. He said, the prophet said, look, you're not going to play that chicken butt game with me. You said you're going to be here a week and you wanted to learn. You're coming back tomorrow. So the young man said, okay, all right. I'd rather, I'd rather take a whipping with a big stick, but Prophet said, you had better be there. Don't you waste my time. So he said, all right. Prophet told him, you put your pride aside. You fix this. We're going to fix you. We're going we're gonna to get somewhere with the Father. All right. All right. So next night he does a service, you know, same thing. You know, preach for an hour, could have done it in 10 minutes. Young man uh, says, ah, there's no need for a, whole, a, a healing line. Prophet says, no, 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 no. There's a healing line. Let's go. So he said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. He says, watch, boy. Calls someone up. He says, all right, pray for this, for this person. This person. Come here. You pray for this, for this person. And he explained it to them. And he explained it to them. And how amazing that was for that to happen that way, that young man actually did stay for a week, and, and, he, and, he, and he did smile at the end of the week, I guess. He didn't come back, 
But there's something to be said about a seasoned prophet helping out a young prophet and taking correction and bringing him up the way that he needs to be brought up to do what needs to get done. I mean, it is so important. I mean, the older, the seasoned, matured prophet gave the effort, gave the opportunity for the young prophet to learn. I mean, pre-adventure, he could have... He could have just saved his life, could have stopped him from burning in hell. Who knows what could have happened if the prophet hadn't taken the time to be able to show him what he needed to show him. Never saw him again, but pre-adventure. Pre-adventure. See, God loves us greatly. Enough to rebuke us, enough to give us the truth, the kind of love that we need to learn kind of love that we need to learn to love that kind of love of correction and rebuking you know we've had all that we can all that we can stand with people saying god says this and god says that cursing everybody i mean there was another example here um, at a church you know and, and and people were getting up and they were saying different things and 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 in the modern church what prophet's talking about is they get up and they prophesy all the time and, 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 the, and the words that they try and give people and, and all this. And what he's saying is, in this example, that approximately 95, 98% of that is false. You know, I mean, really at the end of the day, if it's 2% false, that's still bad. But what he's saying out in, in the world, in the church, of what's being done out there, tying God to something that's false, is, is, is real close to, to a 98, 95%. I mean, it makes the flesh man feel good, you know, saying God says so the flesh man can, can, yeah, yeah, you know, spirit and that person and the flesh man giving high fives or something or however that works. Yeah, getting each other all comfortable. Should be the fear of the Lord God that you don't make the mistake. You don't want to say it. You don't want to do it. The flesh and the mind are going to lie to you and lie to you and lie to you and try and tell you it's God and it has nothing to do with God. I mean, here's one. What if it was a, uh, people said it half right? What if if someone was tying God to something and they're half right? Does that mean they get a half a curse? No, they still get the full curse. There's, There's none of that going on. But the flesh and the mind, they want to justify, and they want to justify. you got to spend your time with the Father. You're either being blessed or you're being cursed. There's no gray area. It's one or the other. I'll leave you with this. You have to be very, very, very careful who you are sitting under and what you are gathering in. You are responsible for what you sit under. We read the scriptures earlier and last week. You are responsible. God is trying your heart to know what the word that you know to be able to come out from under the false. God is not a respecter of persons. We know that. We are all sheep. If somebody is a prophet and then they're a false, what's God going to do? God's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's not a respecter of persons. You are to come out from that. You choose. God ran all of this before any one of us in First Fruits and Ephraim, the remnant, were involved. And he can run it without any of, any of us. He doesn't. Any of us could not be here. God will get it done. I mean, if we could just learn that to help put our pride down a little bit. But we're here to get it right. We've got to be careful not to get into legalism. So we don't get into the curses of legalism. Really? Oh, yeah. Prophet has an example of somebody that said, well, before I come in the sanctuary, I'm going to wash my feet and wash my hands and and before we come into the the church service. So he says, well, that's nice. I mean, your feet might smell better, but uh, no. 
No, he says, don't do that. Why? It, it isn't a requirement. The temple isn't here. The prophet's saying there's, there's a curse involved in legalism. There's, there's curse involved in legalism with different feasts that are legalisms, not of God. It's our job to learn as we transition, as we come out of this, not to be connected to those things. God is taking us there and we can't see where there is. But we've got to let go of these legalism, these, these things, these preconceived ideas we're dragging forward. You have to know what God is doing then in the law, and we have to know what God is doing now in the law. He's not changing it, but he's changing our understanding of it. He's not changing his word. So we need to sit down, we need to sh uh, shut up, we need to stop arguing. We need to have a real prophet. We need to have real prophets come in and clean house and have some people get put in the dirt. If it has to be, that's up to God. But this is not gonna work until we have the real prophets stand up and the real prophets do what God wants done so that the people say, that is a real prophet. That is God. This is the way to go. Until then, this isn't going to work. The unity tying it together. The Father is going to show up. Enough of our opinions. This will work through the demonstration and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what Prophet says in this teaching. Everyone else is just going to line up when that happens. And it's going to happen over and over and over and over as we go forward. See, God has used this teaching for what it is that God needs to use it for, as he does. Let's end in prayer. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for the prophet's teaching. Thank you for what you have invested in him. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to preach his teaching, Father God, so that your anointing can come through this teaching and to speak Father, to our hearts, so we have spiritual eyes to see, ears to hear, Father, all of us, so we may join hand in hand and learn to love each other, Father, to go forward, Father, to break the bondage of darkness, of familiar spirits, the curses and enjoy the blessings falling on one another, Father God, because that is what you promised your kids. It's our job to get holy and stay holy. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen.